good morning, Journey. Uh, my name is Justin. I'm one of the high school, middle school coaches here. I'm also Pastor Camp's mentor. Um, <laughs> killed both services. I love that one. Um, well, I first want to say, if it's your first time at Journey with us, we're so excited to have you here as a guest. Um, please scan one of the barcodes while you're here. Not so that we can stalk you, but we just want to introduce ourselves, get to know you. Uh, I first wanted to share that yesterday we had our gritty friendship, not a man camp, as Casey's been calling it. Um, and I'm just really encouraged by how many guys we have among us that are really looking for godly friendships, that are really looking to go deeper, to get gritty, as Carlisle would say. Um, I'm thankful for his guidance in that too. So uh, if you were there or if you weren't there, definitely stay tuned for men's ministry things coming up. Uh, take advantage of all these guys that, that want to get to know you and care for you. Um, really quick, Karen is going to tell us about a sweet four-bed, three-bath over in Sun City that you can check out. That's right. I'm Karen McMahon with the West USA Realty. No, that's not why I'm here. I am actually here to tell you about a women's event we are having tomorrow night, and all of you are going to want to be here. It is our third annual Safe Fair. Say farewell to summer, because hopefully it's going to be gone soon. <laughs> Please, Lord. And we are going to have um, your, an opportunity for you to come and find out about all the different Bible studies that we have available for the women. We have them on Zoom. We have them here at the church. We have them in homes. So there is something for every time and everyone's schedule. We're going to serve dessert, which is always really fun, um, and it's a good draw. It's a come and go, but like I said, first service, you're going to want to come and stay because there's some fun things planned. It's from 6 to 7.30, and if you're coming, if you will go on the Journey website under events and register, that will help us plan for for desserts, but it's going to be fun. You'll get lots of information, and I'm actually up here to supervise Justin's first announcements. So let's give him a hand. He did a great job. So, cool. So uh, one thing that is an exciting change for us here at Journey, I want to tell you about. It has to do with that sign back there in the corner for communion. Um, so just a little bit of context. Uh, Journey, we're on this 10-year plan right now. We've worked on first being a relationship church, reaching wider. Um, and then if you've been with us for at least the last year, you know that we're really focused on walking deeper, getting rooted in our faith. Um, now we're going to start transitioning into this third phase as being a worship church. And that's not just for Sundays, not just for Mondays, uh, but that's preparing to worship Jesus for eternity. And one way the church has done that historically has been through the Lord's Table, communion, Eucharist, whatever you call it. Um, so one thing that we're going to start doing is offering that weekly here. So it's going to be me, some other friendly faces over there after service. Uh, it's just going to be a quick few minutes for us to reflect on the love that we get to stand on with Jesus. Uh, maybe just reevaluate maybe some things I need to confess, some things I need to commit to after this week's message, uh, and then ultimately get to celebrate at the Lord's table. So I hope you'll join me over there. We do have some brochures with some more information if you're not super familiar with the Lord's Supper. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to pray, and then we'll hop into today's message. So, uh, Jesus, thank you for this ability that we have to gather. Uh, I pray for those who don't have the same safety, just that you'd be protecting them today. Um, as we get started in this series, would you just challenge us, uh, whether it's our first time through the Sermon on the Mount, whether it's our thousandth time, just challenge us to take that next step deeper as a disciple um, and to live in this upside-down kingdom that you've given us admission to. Amen. Thank you, Justin. Good morning, everybody. My name is Allie. I'm the Kids Ministry Director here at Journey Church, and I'm up here today to introduce something new that we're going to be doing. For our series of Modnik, we're going to be having one of your kiddos come up on stage with a coach, and they're going to read our verse from our sermon for that week. So we have Levi Kipper up here today. And he's going to be reading Matthew 5, 2 through 12. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for their for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and th thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in in heart. 
for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs in the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others reveal you, when persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven. For your reward is great in heaven, for the, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Good job, Levi. Let's give him a hand. So um, Levi is Chelsea's son, if you didn't know, because she had her camera recording all that. She leads us in worship. His dad's back there. He's one of our provisional elders. So I think that that's like a pre-pastor thing that might have just happened right there. So we are in our second week of Madik, which is kingdom spelled backwards. We're actually getting into the text, um, the first few verses that Levi just read for us. So I want to start by asking a question. I like to ask questions on a one to 10 scale. One's always low, 10's always high. So that's your scale. Three questions. Question number one is this. <clears throat> right now, in this moment, right now, how happy are you? It's a happy question. You got to pick a happy number, one to 10. And, and don't worry, it, like, Jonathan, as you share your number right now, because I want you to share, if it's not like a 7 and you think um, it should be a 10, give them some grace, okay? So everyone give grace to each other. Share with someone next to you how happy you are right now, 1 to 10. Pick a number. Yeah, you're whispering it. Keep it quiet. Don't let anyone know. Talk to yourself, Clarice. Second question. So think back to the hardest part of your week. The hardest part of your week. What's your happy number? One to ten. One low, ten high. Hardest part of your week. Share with someone next to you. Last question, because, you know, the energy is so palpable in the room as you're talking about your happy scale. (laughs) Happy! All right, the best part of your week, what was it? So we had negative part, best part of the week. So hardest part of your week, what was your number? Then what was your best part? So as you think back, the best part of the week, number one to 10, what was it? Share with the person next to you and smile. <laughs> Let's fake happy for a second as we talk about it. All right, so happiness, here's the thing. I think it's a tricky little booger, isn't it? It really is. Because happiness is subjective. And what that means is happiness to me might not be happiness to you. My numbers were my numbers. Your numbers were you, your numbers. So I found some research. Happiness indicators across the world. So let's look at them. Austria. Their happiness indicator, the more healthy you are, so like 10, would be no health problems. Finland. They're just so kind, those Finns. That's what their happiness scale is based on. Kindness. Greece, physical thing, beauty and handsomeness. Britain, sense of humor, or depending on how you spell it, as a Brit, you put a U in there, that's what theirs is. I have other things I was thinking about with, with um, Britain, but I won't, I'm not trying to dog anyone's um, country where they're from. Italy, money. That's their, how, the more money you have, the more happy you are. Japan. The more money you are, the more happy you are. America, us. The more money you you have, the more happy that you are. Here's one more for us in America, that we are right now, us in America, are the unhappiest we have been in 50 years right now. And this was evaluated before election stuff and before inflation stuff and before record temperatures in Phoenix for the second summer in a row, even though this morning was pretty nice, wasn't it? Kind of nice. A little humid now, but it's been nice. <clears throat> what do you see about that list? What does that list have in common? What did the questions that I asked you have in common this morning? Determina- determiners of happiness are about circumstances, your circumstances. Is that not the case? Isn't that what we do? We Our happiness is determined by our circumstances, and you can deny it, and you can say, no, I'm different than that, but it's really not that different. We all evaluate our happiness based on our circumstances, and the thing about circumstances is that's one of the least things that we can control in our lives. 
Circumstances are affected by all kinds of things that I don't have any control over. The weather this morning, when thunder and lightning when we got up, we didn't have control over that. That could have affected your happy scale on the positive. The traffic. Traffic is a big indicator for me. It changes my happy scale quickly when people are driving too slow in front of me. Uh, I have a little uh, thing on my watch that tells me each morning what my sleep score is. Sometimes it tells me uh, in, in watch language, my watch language, you'll probably be grumpy today because <laughs> I didn't get enough REM sleep. Or, and so it's like predisposing me, telling me what my circumstances will be based on my sleep, things that I can't necessarily control. So we have little control of our happiness because we have little control over our circumstances. But today... In the first part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying that there's something different than circumstances to determine our happy scale. That's what we're going to learn about today, that there's something else. And it's called the Beatitudes, which is an interesting thing because Jesus never uses the word. That's a Latin word for a Greek word that means blessed. So it's not about attitudes, by the way. It's not even about your circumstances. It's about some things that Jesus is going to tell us about. So I have a slide up here to tell you what the equivalence of what blessedness is. Happy, content, soul-satisfied, flourishing, living the good life. Does those make sense to you? That's what blessed means. So you can write those down, take a picture. That's what I want you to be focusing on, not just for this week, but for this whole series. Pick your word about what the Beatitudes mean blessed is, pick your word up there. So before we go through this list, eight of the Beatitudes, I want to unpack a little bit about what Jesus really meant, because we have those words about what they mean in in our language, in our culture, but what did Jesus really mean? What he was trying to tell us is that part of it is what happiness would look like, but it's actually deeper than that. It's what happiness lives like. Did you hear the difference? What happiness lives like, not what happiness looks like. So last week when we started this, it was a great Sunday. One of our elders, Joel, was up here and he read the whole Sermon on the Mount. Wasn't that great? Some of you thought that he had like a little earpiece, like a little cheater thing. Uh -uh. That dude had most of that memorized. Wasn't that great? And he had just come in from um, Europe that night. He still did it. And, And while I was Given an introduction, I said that what this actually is, because it says that Jesus saw the people, went away, and sat down, and the disciples sat, came and sat at his feet, so he was preaching to his disciples. So this is about discipleship making, what it looks like to be a disciple. That's what the Beatitudes are. It's about those that are following Jesus, and that's what the definition of a disciple is, those who learn from Jesus and those who live like Jesus. Blessed are those who learn from Jesus and live like Jesus. This is a a living thing. So today's message, the Beatitudes, is not about attitudes, even though we like to think about it. It kind of is, but not really. It's not about our circumstances. It's a calling to be a certain type of person who does a certain type of life. A calling of a certain type of person to do certain types of things like Jesus did them and asks us to do them. So it's kind of like a little slice of heaven, because as you read these, blessed are because for, blessed are for, they get a little slice of heaven here, regardless of your circumstances, and we get to live them here now. It's not a when we get to heaven thing. Jesus didn't say, blessed will you be, blessed are you now, on your Monday and your Tuesday. Really, what what the Beatitudes are about, these blesseds are, are really about identity because this is about your identity as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus who learns from Jesus and lives like Jesus. So let's talk about identity for a second. Identity speaks for itself. Your identity really speaks loudly, speaks consistently, speaks continually about who you are and what you are. So here's my first analogy of the day. Tina and I just got to go on a, a big trip. We loved it. We saved up for a couple of years. We went to Europe to go on a cruise. We saved up all the money so we didn't have any talking about how we're going to pay it off. It was great. And so here's a picture. Aren't we such a cute European-looking couple? It's one of our 
favorite spot, Sorrento. Looking all European, aren't we? That little hat. Tina got it for me because she knew how good I'd look in it. <laughs> My little side sling body thing. Looking all European, right? <laughs> no. We were very American <laughs> in that picture. Uh, I don't think we were undercover Europeans over there. We have certain things that, certain definite markers of our identity as Americans, that the way we carry ourselves, even if I had a little cute cap on, I still looked like an American guy, I talked like an American guy, I acted like an American guy. People knew where we were from for all kinds of reasons. So these Beatitudes are kind of like that. Jesus is describing us the way we're supposed to be, and that it's our identity, that when people see us, like people saw Tina and I and knew something about us, That when people see us as disciples of Jesus, they will know about Jesus because our identity is a disciple of Jesus. So, and each of these Beatitudes has this description of what it would be like. So as our identity is in Christ as a disciple, a little slice of heaven comes on us on earth. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs will be the kingdom. So blessed are the disciples of Jesus because they live like Jesus. That's really what it is. They will live like Jesus and experience heavenly things here on earth on Monday. You don't have to wait till eternity. This is a proclamation from Jesus. It's not an invitation from Jesus. It's a proclamation. Blessed are you as you live this way. It's not an invitation. Blessed could you be. Blessed are you as. This is a proclamation to be a part of his kingdom, what he's doing here on earth, the backwards kingdom, backwards from the world. So he's not just telling us how to be, he's telling us who to be. You get the identity thing that I'm trying to get at? You'll talk a certain way, you'll act a certain way, you'll live a certain way. When people see you, they'll see Jesus. So I want you to remember a couple of things as we jump into these. This is a way of life now. It's not a hope. It's not a pie-in-the-sky thing. It's not a then. It's a here-and-now thing. Get it? It's something that we don't hope for only, that we actually live with. So in this, as we go through the list, you might not be a 10 on all of these, this 1 to 10 scale thing. So, so maybe you'll be a 3 on 1. But part of the identity thing that we can start to shift is as we become a disciple of Jesus, we move from a 3 to a 3.25. We move from a 3.25 to a 3.5. So that's, that's our goal, not that we've attained it, but that we get to be a disciple of Jesus moving toward it. So that's what I'd like to pray for. Would you join me in that? Jesus, we thank you for this proclamation today that we can live now like you. This isn't a pie-in-the-sky thing that we hope for, that we can't attain, that we can't reach for, that it was only for you. You want this for us here and now. Thank you, Jesus, for this proclamation. May we live in it as we hear it and as we leave this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Levi read from the the passage for us. There's eight of the Beatitudes. And so I thought there's different ways to try to teach this to you for us to think about them. So I came up with one way that I thought would work for us. Justin kind of introduced it. Good job. So, uh, you should know the answer because he gave it to you. What is our forward mission here, a journey? Whew. Very good. You were in the first service and saw that they failed. All right. They didn't get it for service. So do your homework, people. Reach wider, walk deeper. Four words. Memorize them. That's what we're working at. So what I thought would be nice is for us to think about them in two categories. There's four for reaching wider and there's four for walking deeper. By the way, it's easy to think about reaching wider. You think about evangelism, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus. We do that. Arms open, reaching wider. Walking deeper is spiritual maturity, that we're maturing, becoming more knowledgeable in the faith. That's what we do. That's why we exist as a church. So one way to think about these is divide them into two categories. So that's what I did. I divided them into two categories. We have them up here on the screen for you. The first side is poor in spirit, mourning, meek, and righteous. We're going to unpack those. Those are walking deeper. That's the interior part of your life. That's, That's you the community part of your life, the reaching wider part that's communicated outside of you is the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemaker, and being persecuted. So 
That's what we're going to do. We're going to unpack those. We're we'll jumping into the first one, poor in spirit. So a lot of these are, are rich words, rich phrases. This one is too. It kind of has two sides of one coin. Same thing, but two parts. One side is about humility, and one side is about being lesser noticed. Humility and being lesser noticed. So the, the first one about humility is that poor in spirit means that our spirit is subjected to the spirit of Jesus. We are poorer in spirit, greater with Jesus' spirit. So there's a cool thing. We subject ourselves to God's very spirit from Jesus. So you get to be you. Jesus gets to be Jesus. You are still distinct. You are still unique. You still have your spirit, but it's subjected to Jesus' spirit. That's what that means. You are poorer in spirit so that Jesus' spirit is greater in you. That's the first side. So you know that phrase, I hate you, you do you. I hate it. Unless you're poor in spirit because you do you the best you that you are because you're subjecting yourself to Jesus. You get what that first side of the poor in spirit coin means? The second side is this that we are lesser noticed, that we don't strive so hard to be noticed. In our culture these days, the see me, notice me, like me, click me, notice me culture, this is us taking the back seat to the first seat of Jesus, the front seat of Jesus. That's what this means, to not notice me, but to notice Jesus when you notice me because I'm poor in spirit. So this is a both end. You get to be you, Jesus gets to be Jesus, and the world gets to see both of you. You're the best version of you as you are poor in spirit. Let's keep moving. Mourners. <clears throat> so just like poor in spirit, this mourners has two sides. We understand this one, unfortunately. We know what it means to mourn. We know what it means to go through what I call the agony and the celebration of loss when we do celebration of life services. I say we, we're putting lipstick on a pig. We're trying to be happy even though we're in agony because we're experiencing loss. Something that we had in our life that brought something good to our life is no longer in our life and we're renegotiating our life because something that was good is missing and we mourn over it, whether it's your job, your dog, or your spouse. But this mourning is not over jobs, dogs, or spouses. It's about this discipleship thing. You're mourning over the way life should be. You're mourning over the blessed life things. You're mourning over that life isn't flourishing on earth. You're mourning over the sin around you. You're mourning over the sin in you. You know we all have this angsty thing that we know this is not as it should be, that it's supposed to be better than this. And that should make us sad. That's what this is about. This is about a holy discontent with the kingdom of the world compared to the kingdom of Jesus. Mourning that things are not as they should be. It's thinking of your sin and being sad. That, that's a thing that plagues you. It's looking at your community it's looking at our world. It's looking at our country. Here's what I say about sin. You hear me say it all the time. Sin kills things. Sin kills people around you. Sin kills you. That's worth you being sad over. Jesus certainly was sad over it. So disciples of Jesus mourn over their own sin, and disciples of Jesus mourn over the sin of the world around them. Next one is meek. So understanding meekness is really coming to an understanding of your influence, the influence that you have. That's really the word here. It means lesser influence, like lesser noticed was the, the word we looked at before. This is lesser influence. A lot of times we think this word means to be weak or to be passive, and that's not what meek means. Not at all what it means. It actually is a word about being assertive, but not being aggressive. Do you know the difference? Assertive is trying to get your point across or trying to get what you want without respect or concern for the other person. That's aggressive. Assertive is you do have concern and respect for the other person as you 
get your point across or as you get what you want. So here's the thing. You bring something to the table in the kingdom of Jesus as you are his disciple, as you have identity in Christ. You need to understand the weight that you bear. You have spiritual weight as you become a disciple of Jesus. Meekness means you're aware of your weight and you exert your weight. You know what you bring to the table and you bring it to the table. That means that you're understanding the moment that you find yourself in, moment by moment, as you subject yourself humble in spirit and mourn over sin. You, you know the moment that you're in with a stranger. You know the moment you're in with your spouse. You know the moment you're in when you're by yourself and having a response. It's taming your response, but having a response. That's what meekness means, taming your response, but having a response. I like to think of it as a countenance thing, like having a countenance of influence, that in the moment you have presence and that you have impact that informs more than the moment. What I like to say, it's like when people do the tilt. Hmm. Know what I mean? You, you represent Jesus in a way by the way you speak, by the way you live, by the way you act, and they notice. And maybe even on the inside, they're going, hmm, that's different. That's different from this kingdom of the world. So I'm making people do the tilt. Next one is hunger and thirst for righteousness. So this is the last one on the walking deeper side, and it's about righteousness. So this really is the bottom line then for the walking deeper side. And what this is, is taking care of your business, taking care of, of you as it concerns your heart, your head, and your actions. So I have a really cheesy analogy for you. Second analogy of the day, it's really cheesy, and it's actually about cheese. Are you ready? So um, Tina and I made this fabulous culinary discovery when we were over in Europe. It's like life-changing. Mozzarella cheese from water buffaloes. That's all there is there. Game changer. I can't tell you. Oh, so good. I even found some at Fry's Marketplace, a little advertisement. I'm like gazing at the cheese section going... And this is the lady putting the cheese out goes, can I help you find something? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, I was, I'm looking for a water buffalo cheese. She goes, oh, it's right, right where I was looking. I was looking like a man. You know, we, it was right in front of me. It, it's a game changer, I'm telling you. Here's the thing about that cheese. Our cheese here in America, <sighs> don't have a taste for it. It doesn't taste like anything. This cheese, man, we have an appetite for it. Sought it out. That's what this means. Righteousness means that we have an appetite for the things of God. And we've tasted the things of God. And the things not of God, we're like, ooh, that has an aftertaste. There's no richness to the taste of that. It loses its appeal. We don't have an appetite like we used to for unrighteousness, a.k.a. sin. We know and appreciate God's design for how life was supposed to be the way he designed it to be. It's not inferior, and it's better. It means that sin loses its appeal. So a desire for righteousness, thirsting and hungering for righteousness, means that, that you no longer accept the things of the world as okay. The things of the kingdom are the things that are okay now. This blessed life, you don't want to live it at the expense of, of the kingdom of the world, because it's an inferior. So after we deal with our interior lives, walking deeper, we move to the other side to the reaching wider, and the first one there, so this is community life versus interior life, is to be merciful toward our community, toward those around us. So mercy goes beyond fairness. Mercy is extreme and generous fairness. Extreme and generous fairness. Mercy is not evening the score. It's exceeding the score. It's like letting them win in a way. We'll, we'll unpack it a little more. In the, it's the opposite of the kingdom of the world and our cancer culture that people get offended by what we believe, by our values, by our actions, by things that we feel or say, and they cancel us out. So there's two sides of this coin too for us to think about. First one is a mentality of forgiveness rather than retribution. That we have a, a mentality like Jesus has. Because forgiveness, forgiving, always releases the person from the offense, our offense. But it's not this. 
That's not what, what merciful is. It's not calling unrighteousness righteousness, ever. It's not calling sin okay. Jesus never, ever, ever did, never, ever will call your sin okay. He'll never say, Carlisle, yeah, move towards sin. I understand all your triggers. I understand your trauma. I understand the things in your life. I understand why you would sin. It's okay. You can feel okay about your sin. Jesus never did that. He forgave your sin by dying for your sin. That's what mercy does. So that's the first side. Calling things what they are, but having some mercy and offering forgiveness to be forgiving people. The other side is that we all need to have thicker skin. All of us need to have a thicker skin and be less hurt by the things that hurt us sometimes, especially in a world that's backwards and not following the kingdom of Jesus. The chances are that as we become disciples of Jesus, and we'll get into this in a second too, that the chances of you getting offended are pretty high. Get used to it. Be offended. You can be offended knowing that they follow a different set of standards than a disciple of Jesus follows. In a world that condemns and cancels us, we have mercy and hope and mourn over their non-recognition of the things of the kingdom. That's mercy. There is a place and a time to take a stand. We'll get to that in a second. The next one then is pure in heart. Being pure in heart means that, that we align ourselves with the desires of God's kingdom rather than asking God to align himself with our kingdom. That's what it means. It's, it's actually about having a clean agenda before God. So if you want to do your English word, clean agenda is what pure in heart means. So I was thinking about me and my agenda. I'm, I'm a guy full of agenda. I'm going to tell you my struggle. I think it's probably the, the beatitude that I struggle the most with right now in my life. So when I think about how much I love NOPO, Northwest Peoria, I love this community. I love you. I really do. I'm a little obsessed with you. I'm a little obsessed with our church. I'm a little obsessed with our community. I'm obsessed with the responsibility we have to our community about the gospel of Jesus Christ who saves us from our sins and changes our Mondays. I'm a little obsessed. Have you noticed? But here's the thing about me that's maybe not so pure. I'm a forward-moving kind of guy, and I really hate it when my way gets blocked. Don't I, Clarice? Clarice works for me. She, she understands. I do not like my way getting blocked. And so, on. you know, it's all so pure and pastory, my agenda for you, my agenda for our church, our agenda for a new building when our lease is up, all these things. And, and it's hard. And I'm all about efficiency and moving forward. And sometimes my timing and God's timing don't match up. And my pure in heart agenda is like, come on, Jesus. You've told us some stuff. You have a, a vision for this community and you're using our church in this community. We're waiting. That's not pure in heart. Get it? That's an example of my agenda trying to supersede God's agenda. And that's not pure in heart. So we all have to offer our agendas to Jesus, to his kingdom. Next one is peacemakers. This one we might get confused. So this is what you have to do. This is not peacekeepers. It's not what this is. It doesn't say peacekeepers. Peacemakers. So peacemakers seek peace, but don't avoid conflict. It's kind of rich. They don't avoid conflict. They seek peace. They make peace. So if you know that there's a conflict and you don't strive to settle it, you're not being a peacemaker. So there's different ways to do this. When I think about this reaching wider and evangelism, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's a part of our mission as our church. There's different methods to, to do this, to talk to people about the lack of peace in their eternity and the lack of peace in their life when they're not followers of Jesus Christ and doing it in a way that works. We're actually going to have an evangelism class in about a month and a half that you can take probably on a Sunday at lunch is I think what we're going to do. And it talks about styles of evangelism so you know how you can be you as you talk to people and make peace with God for them through Jesus Christ. So that's one way to think about this. But I have a story that I want to tell you about peacemaking that I experienced 
because of the strength of God and his word and the strength of personal relationship, which what peacemakers usually use to bring peace. So it happened in our church. We had a series last summer that was a little controversial. Some of you were here, some of you know it was woke or awake. And what our proclamation was is that the word of God and the church of Jesus is already awake. And so it was counter to the woke agenda around us. And there were people in our church that didn't like it. There were people in our church that, that left. There was this person that's still in our church that during this time, during this um, controversial series that we did, she made a Facebook post. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we have to be silent. And I saw this Facebook post and I went, oh man, I saw it. And I'm her pastor. I have to talk to her about it. Oh man, I have to make peace. So jumped on it, I saw her at church, said, hey, saw your post. Could we have coffee? Could we get together and chat about the post a little bit? Would you be open to that? And she said, yeah. By the way, she said I could share this, so you're not going, who's he talking about? Um, she gave me permission. I'm not going to tell you who it is. But so she came here to the church. <laughs> she's so sweet. She's a great lady. And she just said to me, as she, she sat down, you just need to know, Carlisle, I'm about as woke as you're ever going to get. I'm like, well, good start. <laughs> so I opened up my Bible and said, so I saw your post. This is what you said about your post. In your post, this is what you were affirming in your post. But there's this verse in Genesis. Have you thought about this verse in relation to your post? And she did the tilt. Huh. Right before my eyes. I was making some peace between her and God and the agenda of the kingdom of Jesus. Do you understand what I'm talking about? God and relationship. That's how peacemakers can make peace. So there are times to be silent. There's some battles that we don't fight, but the thing is, those are going to be fewer and far between these days. It really is. Peacemakers don't avoid conflict. Peacemakers use God and his word and relationship to show people what the kingdom of Christ looks like. Next one, persecuted for righteousness. So it's the last one. It kind of makes sense. It can kind of be a, a no-brainer in a world that's actually backwards. Modnik, backwards kingdom, we're actually the forward kingdom, the kingdom of Christ. The world is the backwards kingdom, but they think that we're the backwards kingdom. They don't think we're headed in the right direction, and we're the ones regarded as backwards. We're the weird ones in our culture. Jesus is telling us, be prepared for this. Be, pre be prepared to be the weird ones. I'm used to it. I lived my whole life weird, different kind of weird. But it's telling us to get used to this, that we're the weird ones. We are viewed as the misguided ones. We are viewed as the simple-minded ones. We are the ones that are labeled. We could even be mistreated and discounted because we follow the kingdom of Jesus rather than the kingdom of the world. So Jesus says this is going to happen, and he actually ends the Beatitude saying the mark of a disciple is that you'll be persecuted. He takes it even a step farther and says, celebrate when you get persecuted. Celebrate, like have a party, a persecuted party, persecution party. You know what else he's actually saying? That if you're not getting persecuted because of your faith, maybe not so good on the discipleship scale, on the one to 10 scale. If we're not getting persecuted by living as disciples in the kingdom of Jesus on the back half, one to five, rather than a six to 10. And he's calling us to be persecuted because our faith is being lived out in our world. So there you have it, the eight Beatitudes. A little intense, keep your seatbelts on. The whole sermon on the mount is a little intense. So what I want you to do is as you look at these, I want you to pick one on the first column and think about it this week. How can you tick it up a little? Take it from a three to a 3.25. Pick one of those. Just pick on one. Work on one. On the other half, work on one too. Two things this week for you to become a disciple of Jesus. And I want to throw out two phrases that I want you to really focus on these next 11 weeks as we finish the Sermon on the Mount. And here they are. Never 
stop hoping for Jesus' kingdom to come here on earth. It's a here and now thing that Jesus says. Never stop hoping for it. No matter what's going on in your world, no matter what the circumstances of our culture, of our city, of your life, of your heart, never stop hoping. And then as we continue on for the rest of the series, never stop pushing in the rest of your life. Never stop pushing for Jesus' kingdom to come on the earth. Hope for it, push for it. That's what disciples of Jesus do. Got it? Good. Let's do that. All right, let me pray for us, and then I'll jump into one last thing. Jesus, we thank you that you call us to be different, that you give us a different identity that comes from you as disciples of you that are living here now in your kingdom. And we thank you that it's not backwards, that it actually does make sense, and that we can aspire to it and hope for it and live it. Help us to do that as we live with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I have a few more minutes. I'm going to use all my time. I want to talk to you about groups. So Journey Church, as I said last week, is a, a church of groups, not a church with groups. Part of the lifeblood of our church is being in community. We say we're a relationship church. We have a relationship through groups. And so what I wanted to do is, uh, I say this, it's a play on words. Sometimes people get offended. Every once in a while, I should on you. Should on you. You should be in a group. You're missing out. You're missing out on the relationship that we have as we talk about these things and become disciples of Jesus together within the confines of community. So we have all these groups up here are groups that are open for you to join. 14 groups for our church. I think that's fabulous. Good job for you leaders. We have a couple of rooted groups, which are a discipleship group. I have one on Thursday nights. I have a few slots. I'm inviting you. You can come. We have a young adults rooted group that's getting started up. The orange dots mean that those are groups that can accommodate families with kids. So they come to the house. You got to work that out with the leaders. There's a group for everyone here. Be in a group. It will change things. This whole relationship church thing, discipleship church, worship church. That's how we start to do it together. Being disciples and community with each other. So join a group. It'll change your life. If you want to stop by the back for prayer or praises, there's some people there that you can share what's going on in your life and they'll pray with you right there. And then Justin's coming in to administer the sacrament of communion to those who would like to do that. We will do it, by the way, every first Sunday of the month together. But if you want to do it in between times, every Sunday you can do that. Be blessed as you go as a disciple of Jesus living your life on Monday. Okay.